Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with the top reports from the global economy. In today's show, Chile's economic situation becomes explosive. America's best paid female CEO was a man. And America's most promising students are getting paid to drop out. First, the headlines. The dollar strengthened on Tuesday, reaching its highest level since 2008 against the yen amid speculation over U.S. interest rates. The U.S. currency rose 0.3 percent to 106.3 yen, and 10-year Treasury note yields increased two basis points to 2.49 percent. The dollar's gains sent it to 1.2860 per euro, the strongest level in more than a year, and raised it to a nine-month high against the pound. Federal Reserve research suggests investors may be underestimating how quickly policymakers could raise key borrowing costs. A detained former director of Brazil's Petrobras has named dozens of lawmakers and senior officials that received bribes from the state-run oil giant. Brazilian newspapers reported 49 deputies, 12 senators, several state governors and at least 25 lawmakers were involved in a $4.5 billion scandal. The former head of Petrobras' refining and supply unit, who faces up to 30 years in prison if found guilty, was quoted as saying, there was a politician knocking at my door every single day. The claims also threatened to become a stumbling block for President Dilma Rousseff, who seeks re-election. This is an old story. They've only confirmed some things that I already suspected. Irish budget airline Ryanair agreed to buy 100 aircraft from Boeing for $11 billion with an option to purchase an additional 100 planes. Through the giant order, Ryanair seeks to expand from 82 million customers in 2014 to more than 150 million in 2024. The 737 Boeing MAX 200 will accommodate up to 200 seats, up from the 160 in other single ale planes. The first planes will be delivered in 2019. Tunisia urged foreign investment through a conference aimed at restoring investor confidence three years after the country set the ball rolling on the Arab Spring uprisings. Tunisia informed representatives of around 30 countries, 20 international institutions and dozens of private companies on 22 major projects costing $6.5 billion. Investment opportunities include the construction of a deep water port in Enfida, south of the capital, and a dam in north of Tunisia. Tunisia's growth rate for the first half of 2014 fell to 2.1 percent, too low to absorb growing unemployment in the cash-strapped country. The economic and political future of Tunisia is first bound to the choices and actions, the commitments of the government and the political, social and associative forces of Tunisia. But it is also linked to the creation one day of a Mediterranean common market. IKEA on Tuesday reported a 3 percent rise in full-year sales boosted by strong growth in China, its fastest growing market. The world's biggest furniture company said sales in the fiscal year ended August 31st rose to 28.7 billion euros from 27.9 billion in the same period last year. The company generates most of its sales in Europe, but is also expanding in emerging markets. The furniture giant plans to open 25 stores across India. Tokyo-based Rakuten agreed to buy U.S. website Ebates in Japan's largest e-commerce deal since its fiber acquisition. Rakuten, the operator of Japan's biggest online mall, will pay $1 billion for all of Ebates, said in a filing to the Tokyo Stock Exchange on Tuesday. Including Ebates, Rakuten Group aims to create the world's largest product lineup ranging from niche to luxury products. Rakuten seeks overseas growth through acquisitions and has announced 18 acquisitions since the start of last year. Israeli solar power startup SolarEdge Technologies is in talks with financial institutions for a New York listing. SolarEdge, which develops solar power optimizing systems, intends to raise over $100 million in an initial public offering next year, industry sources said. The company provides a photovoltaic monitoring solution that maximizes the power generation of residential, commercial, and large-scale PV system installations. It has so far shipped over 2 million power optimizers to 45 countries.
Chile's economy continues to flounder, President Michelle Bachelet is under pressure to hold her promise of fighting inequality while also boosting the market. But Monday's bomb blast serves as a warning that patience is wearing thin and the issues are explosive. Chilean President Michelle Bachelet is facing a rough road, seeing approval ratings drop five points to 49 percent in August as growth slows and inflation sits above 4 percent. The Chilean economy was already slowing before Bachelet stepped into office. According to the World Bank, growth was over 5 percent from 2010 to 2012 and dropped to just over 4 percent in 2013. And late last week, growth projections for this year were cut to around 2 percent, according to the Wall Street Journal. But Chalet is in power, so she is taking the heat. I'd say that this poll, as far as what's concrete, is a series of warnings for the government as far as how they are building and managing their agenda. This much is clear. As the president announced a $500 million public infusion aimed at re-energizing the economy, labor unrest is also on the table. Chile is the world's top copper mining economy, but the industry has seen a decline in investment, and last week 10,000 copper miners walked off the job to demand greater protections for unions as the government gets set to discuss labor reforms. The great debate for Chile is not just growth. The big debate for Chile is growth with equity, overcoming inequality, and this is fundamental for labor reforms. Otherwise, we're not going to move on from this process of stagnation. President Bachelet took office in a landslide victory last December, campaigning on a promise of fighting inequality in the economy by raising taxes on corporations and pushing for public funding aimed at revolutionizing the country's education system. Those shifts, along with inevitable political tensions, seem to be taking shape. Joining us now is I-24 News editor Karen Kirsch to discuss women in the economy and feminomics. Mrs. Kirsch, thanks very much for joining us. Miss Kirsch. Miss Kirsch, indeed. <laughs> yes, sorry for that. Yeah. So we're talking about Martine Rothblatt. Tell us a little bit about this very, very extraordinary woman. Well, this is the woman, the highest ranking female CEO um, in the United States. We're talking the best paid, right? Yes, best paid female wow. CEO in the okay. United States. I'm, I'm putting the emphasis on the female because she's... Um, uh, at number 90, not 95, but she's probably around the 100s in the gotcha. compared to men. She's certainly not one of the best paid. Yes, right. she is one of the 200, but it's not right. the, the, not the in first top 10 or top 50. But that's not the most interesting piece of information about okay. her. The most interesting piece of information about her is that she used to be a man. She used to be Martin. She used to be Martin Rothblatt. Okay. And she's been Martin since 1994. Interesting. Yeah. And she was successful before she became a woman? She was successful before she became a woman. And she's actually, uh, one of the things that she's saying, she was in an interview uh, in uh, the New York magazine this weekend. Yeah. Um, one of her, uh, the quotes that caught my, uh, me, my attention is that she can't claim to have achieved uh, something equivalent to other women because she spent the first half of her life as a man. Okay. So she, in herself, takes it into takes it into account. She had certain advantages that women generally don't have. Yes, and and it of course raises the question of, of you know, what are the characteristics that perhaps a transgender uh, female would have uh, when you compare her to a genetic female? Mm -hmm. um, is will she be more assertive? Will she be more aggressive, or other sort of, or more demanding in terms of compensation? There's less of a threat of her becoming pregnant, obviously, when she was a man. There's not that issue where a lot of people are hired or yeah. not hired based on that also. Yeah, so, so all of these questions are sort of, um, uh, can really relate to this case. But when you sort of look at the, look at the data, uh, the, the wider data, you see yeah. that this is really no room for comparison. Okay. First of all, she's one of 11 women 11 women in the top paid 200 uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, Fortune 500 companies. So right. that, that's really not a sample of, of any sort. Right. Uh, and when you do check even her um, compared to all the men in the list, um, the women earn about $1.6 million less 
than mm -hmm. the in average right, right than the right. man on the and then the man on the list so there is a still you know a long long yeah. long way to go but when we do try and sort of think of of who she is or what we can learn from her case she's an extraordinary person Okay. The, the road she did to, to get where she is as a man, as a woman, and as a transgender. Now there are a lot of talks about uh, trans economy or sort of the, the role of trans in the workplace. And, and most of them usually suffer from discrimination, right. quite the opposite. So to get where she got uh, while she was being transformed would require somebody really, really personally extraordinary she got into she she owns a pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she established while she was doing the change because her daughter who she had as a man uh, suffered from a, term, a fatal illness and she, and she helped uh, make the cure for that illness um, accessible to all wow. so this is this is this is really no comparison to anything it's kind of sad that we can't use it as a as a as an example for other things um, but is she more assertive? I guess from her quote, then th that's what right. she means. Okay, well, Karen Kirsch, thank you very much for, joi for joining us and uh, giving us more insight on uh, Martine Rothblatt. Thank you very much. Thank you. 20 college-age students are getting $100,000 from a Silicon Valley leader to work on the startup project of their dreams. But to realize their dream, they need to move to San Francisco and quit school first. By the time they reach their 20s, hey Kashik Welcome and Adity will already be budding nice entrepreneurs. To right. Today, they are visiting a biotech lab to find out how to break into the world of medical technology for their new startup projects. Kashik wants to use his computer science training to improve medical care across the United States. I don't like to work on apps or like, you know, I want something that, that has an actionable benefit on people's lives that I can see. And healthcare is one of the biggest problems uh, that we face as, as a humanity. Biotechnology is really... He is working to create a platform that would allow primary care physicians, specialists and hospitals to more easily exchange information. Kashik received a fellowship for $100,000 from a tech leader to develop the project. But the scheme requires recipients to leave college. So Kashik left the prestigious Columbia University where he studied computer science and moved to this San Francisco apartment where he lives with other fellowship recipients. That's what everyone does. You go back to school after you graduate from high school. And, uh, and I, that at one point I decided that didn't make sense for me. 20 exceptional young students under 20 years old were chosen for the program, including Lucy. She already has work experience in computer engineering, designing educational software. For her, the decision to leave college behind her was not an easy one to make. My parents were not happy with the fellowship. They did not want me to do it, and they think that if I don't get my degree, then I'm going to become a hobo someday. <laughs> behind the fellowship program is Peter Thiel, the billionaire who co-founded PayPal, an online money transfer system. Thiel firmly believes that universities stifle innovation rather than foster it. We wanted people to be able to have the time to work on their projects really unencumbered and also not be accruing more debt as a young person. One of the things that we talk about is that if you are a young person, you're accruing debt from school, and that's going to keep a lot of people from working on new things and new projects because you have to start something that's going to pay the bills right away. Kashik is careful not to completely write off school. Depending on how his health care project goes, he may return to university life. Lucy, on the other hand, already has multiple job offers from Silicon Valley companies, all without a diploma. I-24 News journalist Daniel Roth joins us now for an overview of articles from the global media in Media Watch. Daniel, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Good. So I understand we're kind of going on with the same sort of uh, beat that we had before in terms of Entrepreneurs, right? Yeah, what do you have for us? startups, and you know, you you learn from a story like the one we just saw, sort of uh, the two directions you can take into entrepreneurship, into studentship, whatever you know. And uh, here we're actually looking at in the startup world, in this word world that Peter Thiel is trying to, to push forward. Right. Uh, there's actually been a huge drop in American startups, 28% since 19... 28%? 28% between 1977 and 2011. Does uh, it have anything to do with uh, you know, the increased media, people watching more television, just becoming less 
creative? I mean, what is it related to? Did it say what it might be there's, related to? There's a lot of reasons. One of them is that people c come out of life, not just being students, but life in general, mm. in debt. The number one reason for debt is mortgage, which is home ownership. Second reason is now uh, student debt. Uh, but debt is the number one reason. You take less risks, you look towards less uh, 